Hey everyone! Before we begin today, we want to give a huge shout out to our newest patrons, Sarah, Catherine, Angela, Amy, Tiara, Elise, Dixie, Shimani, and Danielle. And a special shout out to Alex who upgraded their pledge. This week we surpassed 100 patrons, which is absolutely wild to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to become a part of our team, head on over to patreon.com slash pod and prejudice and see how you can support us. We've also got brand new Sense and Sensibility merch. Eleanor Dashwood is a goddamn liar merch is now available on our Tee Public store. It's designed by Jess Patino, who also designed our gorgeous Whomst merch. Give Jess a follow at heartdecobk, that's H-E-A-R-T-D-E-C-O-B-K, and click on the link in the episode description to get your Eleanor Dashwood is a goddamn liar merch today. And now, enjoy this week's episode, covering part one of the 1995 adaptation of Sense and Sensibility with our guest, Vanessa Zoltan. We have been doing this podcast now for two years. We are recording this on Jane Austen's birthday, and we're about to go into what is probably my favorite Austen content I have consumed, the 1995 adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. So we are honored to have you with us on this momentous occasion. Thank you so much for having me. I do disagree that this is the best Jane Austen adaptation. I think it is the second best Jane Austen adaptation, but my pick is controversial. So we can talk about that another time. This is Becca. This is Molly. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. We have finished Sense and Sensibility, the novel, and we are finally talking about the movies. You've heard us discussing wanting to talk about these movies for so long, and we are so thrilled to have a very special guest on with us today. We have Vanessa Zoltan from Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, among others. Uh, Vanessa, how's it going? Thank you so much for having me. It's going very well. I have to say to this audience, co-host of Hot and Bothered, whose next season is going to be on Pride and Prejudice. So that is incredible news. We just finished Jane Eyre and we are doing Pride and Prejudice next. We look closely at romance novels. That's a great segue. Do you want to tell our listeners what all you do? Because I feel like you have a lot of podcasts. You've written a book. Like, do you want to tell them about yourself? Yeah. So I am trained as a chaplain, a non-denominational chaplain. And my whole shtick, I I run a small company called Not Sorry Productions, and we treat secular things as if they were sacred. So we're really trying to empower people to love what they love and practice loving your neighbor and kindness and courage by looking closely at secular texts instead of just turning to traditionally sacred texts. So we use Harry Potter, we use romance novels. On our podcast, The Real Question, we change texts every week because we really think that as long as you are getting better at loving, you are doing sacred reading correctly. So that is, that's my work. And so we do all the sort of religious practices with books. So we lead pilgrimages with secular texts. We have a Pride and Prejudice pilgrimage in June in Bakewell and at Chatsworth. Oh my God. I know. It, it, it's a very fun trip. Margaret H. Willison will be leading that for us. And Um, we do small group sort of traditional Bible study, but with Harry Potter or Jane Eyre, um, and seen Pride and Prejudice. So it's not a bad life that I live. I talk about books for a living. And then, yes, my book is called Praying with Jane Eyre, and it is a collection of sermons using Jane Eyre as the liturgy instead of the Bible. That is so stunning and so wonderful. We actually just had a Um, brief little stint on Instagram where I was getting some hot takes roiling because we were asking people if they liked Bronte's and Austin. Yes. I hate that these two women are pitted against each other. Admittedly, Charlotte started the battle. Charlotte was like, I just read Pride and Prejudice and it's freaking mediocre. (laughs) Bad take, Charlotte. Charlotte was also pro-missionary work. She had some bad takes, but she was a uh, lovely flawed um, brilliant woman. Yes. But I got I got raked over the coals online by those who dislike the book Wuthering Heights because it is my favorite book. Oh, mm-hmm. you have a dark, dark soul. That's fine. Yes. Yes. It's I like that in a person. It's not. So 
I I don't like it as a romance. It is not a romantic book. It is a book that is a very interesting philosophical exploration of what evil is. It's a tragedy. It is not a love story. It is not a romance. It is a tragedy. Yes. Yes. So (laughs) anyway, back to the lighter fare that I love to consume. Uh, We have a couple questions we ask every guest that comes on this show. So get ready to uh, give us some of your Austin takes. First one is what's your relationship to Jane Austen? Jane and I have been together a very long time. I spend my life really close reading. I'm about to turn 40. And when I was 15 years old, my favorite English teacher, Ms. Wong, who I actually just reconnected with two weeks ago, bought me a copy of Pride and Prejudice. I should have brought it into the closet with me. I could have like read to you some of the things she wrote. And in exchange for her buying that for me, I asked her to do more work. And I was like, will you do an independent study with me where we read all six Austin novels? And she said, yes. So my junior year of high school, I spent a year with Ms. Wong um, reading all six Austin novels. And then I did it again in college. I took an Austin class where we read the six novels. And so since college, well, and then, of course, I've, like, seen every adaptation, every inspired by, right, like Jane in Austen, Austen Land. I just read a great Jane in Austen. Have you all read that modernization of Sense and Sensibility? It takes place in Austin, Texas. <gasps> so good. Oh, my God. We'll have to cover it's the it. the Dashwoods Girl. It's so, so good. It comes with <laughs> recipes in the back. I love a book with recipes. And so, yeah, I am I am a super consumer of Austin. I will say since I've graduated from college, which has been a while now, I've reread Pride and Prejudice, Northanger Abbey, and Sense and Sensibility. I have not redone Emma, Persuasion, or Mansfield, and I need to. Without spoiling anything for Molly, I think uh, I can say I reread Emma more recently, and I think it holds up real nicely. Mansfield Park is an interesting one to reread because I took a lot from it the second read Mm -hmm. that I did not pick up on in the first read. Yeah, I know that I would not have enjoyed it if I hadn't read it along with teachers. But in Persuasion, back in the day, I was blown away by Persuasion and love the BBC adaptation of Persuasion. But I haven't I just haven't reread it in almost 20 years. So I got to get on that. We actually that is the one of the only books um, that I haven't read by Jane Austen and uh so all of our listeners who really want us to read Persuasion I was like when is it coming and we're like we're procrastinating it because we don't know what the format of the podcast will be (laughs) yeah it's gonna be a a wild ride that we're gonna go on together maybe or maybe you'll read it in advance and we'll figure it out yes uh so question number two uh what is your favorite Austen book or adaptation this is a mean question (laughs) (laughs) how about how about your favorite Austen book and also your favorite Austin adaptation. Like, why? Like, do you want me to pick a favorite child? <laughs> this is just oh, horrifying. All right, I will. <laughs> I'll I'll re- rephrase no, the no, question. No, 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 no. Which one? <laughs> I accept. I we need limits in order to soar. We can't. We'd be here all night. I need to go to bed eventually. I appreciate you putting boundaries. Um, I'm gonna go old school. I do. I love Sense and Sensibility. I think that Persuasion is probably the hottest. I just reread Northanger and it's so fucking funny. And like, I loved Catherine. She, so I love, no, I was going to go big with Pride and Prejudice. I'm going with Northanger Abbey. It is so good. And it could just be, it was the one I've reread most recently. <laughs> so like, talk to me in six months <laughs> when I have reread Pride. And then I am from the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, California. So obviously my favorite adaptation is Clueless. That is a fantastic choice. Thank you. So which Austin character do you relate to the most? (sighs) I mean, obviously Jane from Pride and Prejudice. I am refined and beautiful. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I I, I do love that. Obviously, the Jane Austen named the most beautiful, kindest character after herself. But oh, yeah, I, I mean, I. I'm a Lizzie Bennet, right? Like, aren't we all Lizzie's? Like, us readers, walkers, my favorite thing. I think that Elizabeth Bennet is the person who taught me that it's okay to have walking as a hobby 
and walking is my favorite hobby, and I absolutely learned that from Lizzie Bennett. Can I just mention a few other amazing adaptations? Of course. Okay, so Death Comes to Pemberley, super fun. Everyone should read that. Great. Longborn, I think, is an amazing um, fan fiction retelling by Joe Baker. <gasps> Have you done it? No, we have No, we to. haven't, but we love fan fiction. It is a published novel, but it is it is fantastic. It's the downstairs story of Longborn. So it's about the maids taking care of the Bennett sisters. And there's just this great moment where she's like, freaking hell, Lizzie always comes home with dirty hens. And you're like, right, there is a there is a maid who's cleaning those dirty hens. It's fantastic. There's just so much good Austin content. The Lydia Bennett diaries are obviously incredible. Sorry, the Lizzie Bennett diaries. <laughs> wow, that showed my bias. The Lizzie Bennett diaries. <laughs> so many good adaptations. Wow, yes. And I really want to read Longborn now. That one really speaks to me. It's so good. The other Bennett sister so good about Mary. <gasps> Committed. The Curtis Sittenfeld one. Retelling of Pride and Prejudice. So good. This is not what you want me to do for the next hour and a half, correct? I will stop now. I mean, I wouldn't be mad about it. <laughs> Listen, our listeners want us to do more um, adaptations, especially of Pride and Prejudice. So, and we and we plan to, listeners. We really, really do. There's just so many, obviously. So it's going to take us years already. It's going to take us years, but it's going to take us more years to do all of them. And we will. Absolutely. And just have me back on. I can talk about maybe literally all of them. Amazing. Totally a deal. Uh, we have one more Austin question for you before we dive into the movie. Yes. And that is, what's your hottest Jane Austen take? My hottest Jane Austen take is that Lydia Bennett is a victim and not an asshole. Yes. That is our take on this podcast as well. I see, right. So I'm not sure if it's really a hot take anymore. But like last time I reread it, I reread it when I did the um, Pride and Prejudice pilgrimage in 2018 or 19. And I was like, this poor unsupervised child who was told that her only goal in life is to get married, focused, like, became a little boy crazy. This tracks to me. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And she gets taken advantage of by a bad dude. I Anyway, I, I have a lot of love for Lydia. You know what? Lydia Bennett. So we talk a lot and we've talked a lot. This is a good segue into Sense and Sensibility throughout reading the book that Sense and Sensibility is the Bennett's worst nightmare. And Lydia Bennett is like what Eliza was, kind of. Well, not exactly, but she's the same age, right? right Little right. Eliza. Yeah, yeah. And she could have totally ended up that way. And who knows, in the future, after Pride and Prejudice happens, Wickham could just up and leave her. Well, you should read Death Comes to Pemberley to find out what P.D. James thinks happens Ooh. to Wickham and Lydia. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes, and uh, it's actually in this adaptation we are discussing today, Beth, not little Eliza. <laughs> yeah, right. But that's a perfect segue into talking about this wonderful movie, uh, Sense and Sensibility, 1995, directed by Ang Lee, written by Emma Thompson, starring Emma Thompson, Hugh Grant, Alan Rickman, Kate Winslet, and just an onslaught of Britain's best actors. Essentially introducing Kate Winslet to the world. Yes, this is one of her first star. roles. Yeah. I'm going to start us off with a little trivia, and then we're going to have some uh, impressions of the book, and then we'll go right into talking about the plot and the way that the story has been adapted. So as I said, the movie was written by Emma Thompson, and it is one of the most acclaimed, critically acclaimed adaptations of Jane Austen's work that has to date been made probably in the last 30 years as far as major motion pictures goes this one is the one that gets the most praise so this film was nominated at the oscars for best picture best actress best supporting actress best cinematography best costume design and best original dramatic score and it won for best adapted screenplay it was also nominated for a bunch of baftas including best film best actress in a leading role back to, and best actress in a supporting role. Other fin fun facts about this film include uh, the onslaught of Harry Potter actors that are in it, including the fat lady, Cornelius Fudge, Madame Pomfrey, <laughs> Severus Snape, uh, Sybil Trelawney. Dolores Umbridge. Dolores, Dolores Umbridge. Umbridge. Dr. House. Wait, that's that's not Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. But, but Dr. House <laughs> is in this. 
And he he looks mighty fine. He looks so good. One last little fun fact uh, is that this movie also stars Greg Weiss as uh, Willoughby, <laughs> is Emma Thompson's real life sexy, sexy husband. Molly, did you figure that out before we recorded this? Listeners, I have to be honest with you. Becca told me not to look up the cast, and I assumed she meant don't do a deep dive, but I figured, oh, I can look up Emma Thompson. And then I saw her husband's name, and then I accidentally also went back to the cast page and saw his name again. And then I put my phone down and I gasped and Becca looked over at me and I said, I might have found out something I'm not supposed to have found out. And she was like, what did you find out? And I was like, Emma Thompson is married to Willoughby. <laughs> and Becca just put her hand in her, her head in her hands and was like, oh, no. Luckily for us, she did not get the whole story. <gasps> the Kenneth Branagh part? The Kenneth Branagh part. So as we've discussed before, Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson were married. And then he cheated on her with Helena Bonham Carter and they divorced. So this film was being filmed during that divorce process. And Kate Winslet was the one who decided to try to set up Emma Thompson and Greg Weiss, a pair that are still yeah. married today. Oh my God. Gosh, how did she succeed in that? Also, she's like 17 years old. And she's just like these two older people. She's like, you two would be cute together. She's like, it is actually inappropriate that you're seducing me. <laughs> Fictionally, please seduce the age appropriate person. Yes. <laughs> well, I think the one thing about Sense and Sensibility that's true throughout is that no one seducing Marianne Dashwood is age appropriate. <laughs> I love this film. I have a real problem with the age of the cast members in the movie. I do too. I've watched it now thrice. Uh, well, I've watched the first half thrice. I've watched the second half once. And I, as much as I'm enamored with my sweet, sweet Alan Rickman, it's just too weird for me to watch them together. Well, he he essentially has a surrogate daughter who is her age or older, right? Mm -hmm. And then also, I don't like that Emma Thompson was in her 30s playing Eleanor. Part of what is so heartbreaking about Sense and Sensibility is the amount of pressure that is on this like 19 or 20 year old child. And watching Emma Thompson in her early 30s, you're like, yeah, that looks like a lot, but kind of age appropriate. Like you should be taking care of your family. And then it's so weird that Kate Winslet is age appropriate. Right. So like the feast for the eyes is just very confusing. And I think that the stakes of the movie get messed up. Obviously, Emma Thompson can supersede all with her talent and she's incredible. But I, I find it distracting from the oomph of the movie. I totally agree. And with all, all due respect to Emma Thompson, my queen, my lord, my savior, she kind of, it seems like, wrote the movie to star as Eleanor because she wanted to, which is what a lot of people do and yeah. love her. But I agree, it's distracting. Absolutely. It's one of the only really big flaws in the movie, I think, is the fact that Emma Thompson is just not an age-appropriate Eleanor. She's a perfect Eleanor in every other way, but not an age-appropriate one. Totally. All right, shall we shall we get into this? First of all, um, I think that Vanessa and I have made ourselves clear on our feelings on this movie, which is, I would say, overwhelmingly net positive. Oh my God, it's a, a wonderful film. Absolutely, Molly. Oh, you want you want me to say what I think about the movie? Yeah, just just give us uh, some brief first impressions, if you will, or Pride and Prejudice, as it's later called. <laughs> okay. As I just said, I've watched the movie now once all the way through and two times half and halfway. And I haven't been able to stop thinking about it, um, particularly Alan Rickman as Colonel Brandon. I, as a mostly gay woman, but not 100%, I'm in love with him. <laughs> you know, our patrons know this already because we recorded a, li a little ditty for them, but I, after we watched the movie, I had a dream. <laughs> and in the dream, we were married. And I <sighs> was Marianne Dashwood. I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just, I, I do want to say that her phone background, which is now a lock screen of Alan Rickman playing Colonel Brandon, I woke up the next morning and she was like on her phone in the kitchen. And I looked down and I saw him and I went, Molly! Yeah, so my feelings on the movie are also net positive. I think I have a lot of feelings about 
the adaptation and and we'll get into it as we go along but for me this is on par with the 1995 Pride and Prejudice which also came out that year in 1995 surprisingly good year for Jane Austen adaptation <laughs> and my birth except that the 2005 Pride and Prejudice is better what <gasps> Oh, that is your hottest Austin take. <laughs> that is my hot Austin take. Ooh, 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 ooh. And, and while I know we're not talking about that movie, and listen, I've seen it now like probably 15 times um, of my own volition. I love that movie. And I think that is a super good and also hot take. And I know we're not talking about it, but I, I really want to hear your <laughs> thoughts on it. <laughs> but you're going to talk about it on your show. We will. Don't worry. So I guess we should get into the movie. Yes. So the movie begins. It's beautiful music. It's a good opening credits sequence. We get the whole cast. We get the title page. I love this. We start with Mr. Dashwood on his deathbed begging John to help his stepmother and stepsisters, which I honestly didn't, I wasn't expecting because it feels like such a preamble to the story, but they really went in with it. And I was like, oh, we're going to off the bat. We're going to get into it here. We're setting the stakes. Setting the stakes. It's a high stakes situation. Yeah. They will inherit nothing. It's great. I really enjoy this actor who plays John Dashwood. He gets the simpering really well. He seems pretty determined at first when his dad asks him to help them. He's like, oh, okay. And it cuts to him with Fanny. And he's like, I intend to give them 3,000 pounds a year. And she's like, no. (laughs) And he's so easily plowed over and they really captured him very well. Fanny does have a very cute dog, though. I was going to say poor dog. I know. I was like, oh, Fanny, you suck. But that dog is super cute. I think one thing this film does best is uh, capturing just the amount of casual dogs in the Austin world. Yes, there are amazing dogs in this movie. There's so many. And we're going to clock all of them that we can. I've got two names clocked at least oh well actually did I write them down because I have clocked one of them's name is Casper and one of them's name was I hope I wrote it down because um it was really good it was like Pippin or something like that like something weird but yes the dogs very good also Fanny I didn't like I said I didn't do any further research after I found out about Emma Thompson and Greg Weiss but Fanny's voice sounds really familiar to me she does a lot of audiobooks (gasps) Oh, interesting. I wonder if it's she her. recently read me Sense and Sensibility. No way. Bless her heart. I mean, she's a Royal Shakespeare. She's a you know Royal Shakespeare actor and is, you know, a big deal actress. What's her name? Harriet Walter. Well, after we record this, I'll I'll see if I saw her in anything at the National because or at the Globe or something. Yeah, and she I mean, she's been in a bunch of these kinds of movies. You've definitely seen her before. Yeah, definitely. Also, so while she is convincing John that he doesn't need to give the Dashwoods any money they're like standing outside and she has her dog like in her arms and this woman is beating out a rug above their heads and I thought that was just prime and this movie is so funny yes it and it deals with a lot of like oh you think it would be beautiful to live in this time look at the little literal horse shit that you would have to step over right like it it shows you the like filth of the time and like The lack of sewers. When they're bathing Margaret after she's been like playing outside and they're just like pouring hot water over her. Good stuff. (laughs) So enter the Dashwoods. So we jump to Marianne playing a dirge. Uh, Sweet, sweet Kate Winslet, whose name I can never remember. This has always been a thing for me. I've never been able to remember Kate Winslet's name. She's one of my favorite actors. And I just, it always goes out of my head. But Kate Winslet playing a dirge. She is fresh, 17, and Eleanor comes in and asks her to play something else because Mama has been crying all morning. And this was iconic. Marianne looks at her and doesn't look at her book and she turns the page and she immediately starts playing another dirge. And Eleanor says, I meant something more cheerful, dearest. (laughs) Dearest. Yes. So Then Mrs. Dashwood gets her moment of introduction, and this is Gemma Jones, a.k.a. Madame Pomfrey, such a brilliant actor. Also, um, the mom in freaking Bridget Jones. Bridget Jones. Mm -hmm. She's so, first of all, like, she is so good. 
And she is so beautiful. Like, I hope that I age as gracefully as her. I know. And I think she does a great introduction to Mrs. Dashwood here, right? Like the despair and fretting and concern from her children while grieving, right? Like it's an amazing introduction to this character. Yes. She's all in black and walk, running around being like, I'm being thrown out of my own house or reduced to a visitor in my own house. And she's got, she's crying. It's heart-wrenching. And Mrs. Dashwood's really like a, li- a delicate balance because you want to capture that she's a great mom. You also want to capture her flaws and those two qualities within her bleed together, her over romanticizing plus her deep devotion to her children and acceptance for who they are. Those two things really kind of ebb and flow. So it's very, very delicate. And Gemma Jones really does nail that in this movie. Oh, yeah. Now, This is still all in the introduction. This movie, I did notice um, a lot of the scenes were very short, like cut to, cut to, cut to, which I appreciate because it keeps it moving. And so then we jump to Margaret, who now a common theme in this podcast has been justice for Margaret because she doesn't get enough attention in that book. No, she doesn't. But boy, does she in this movie. I know. (laughs) She's a key player. I can't wait till we talk about our favorite lines. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, me too. Mine is Margaret adjacent. Perfect. Yeah, wait, mine is too. I wonder if we have the same favorite. <laughs> oh, line. no. <laughs> we'll find out. But Margaret's in a tree house that I imagine her dad built for her. Probably. Oh. Or at least ordered to have servants do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. He probably did that. <laughs> but it was probably his thought. Yeah. And so he, she's in a tree house, which, first of all, I love that we get this kind of playful nature. We get to see how these kids are just kids and also that people in this time period were people, which I think that we forget sometimes, or at least society at large forgets when thinking about Jane Austen books. So getting to see in the movie that they're people is always really fun. So she's in a tree house and she won't come down. And Eleanor is like, come on, Fanny and John are coming. You have to come down. And she's like, why do they get to inherit the house? And Eleanor is like, well, it passes from father to son, not father to daughter. And Margaret just doesn't seem to get it. And uh, I love her justice for Margaret. She's my favorite character in this, probably. And she does a great power move, right? She, like, pulls up the rope ladder. Yes. She's like, nope, I'm alone. I'm not coming down. Yeah. And you can't come up. I think this is actually, like, an ingenious addition from Emma Thompson in this screenplay because you don't have a characterization of Margaret, but she really takes time and care to create Margaret and creating Margaret as this sort of little wild adventurer girl not only adds so much color to the character itself and the experience of girlhood to womanhood that this book kind of captures it also and we'll get to it gives Edward really an in to wiggle into your heart (laughs) oh my god you watch them play pirate and you're like I'm in yep I'll follow him anywhere 100% so Moving on from that scene, Eleanor goes to say to the servants that they can only take two of them with them, but that the rest of them will find Fanny a gentle mistress, which is hilarious because then it cuts to Fanny being like, my only concern is how fast they'll be able to move out. And she's like on her way to go (laughs) steal her house. Uh, Yeah. Then they have this dinner scene where Fanny and... John are at the dinner table and they're talking about how Fanny has two brothers. I turned to Becca and I said, does does she not know that they already know Edward? And Becca was like, Molly, they haven't met Edward yet. And I was like, it feels like he knows them (laughs) when like before watching this movie, like I that's my fault for having read the book already, I guess. But like, I forgot that he just met them. I felt I needed to be transparent about that. (laughs) Well, he definitely falls in quickly as he meets them. And you find out through some very, like, save the cat, you know, methodology that he's a quote unquote good guy. Mm -hmm. But I have a theory that came out of this viewing of this movie, which is that Jane Austen hates weak men. Mm. And like that is the problem with John, right? That like Wickham is a bad dude. I'm not sure that Willoughby is like a bad, bad dude. I think he's just weak, right? He's like morally weak and like doesn't keep his promises. 
right? It's floppy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's John too, right? Like John, Weenies. John is actually a moral person. He knows what the right thing to do is, right? Mm-hmm. And he, but he can, I, I think that Austin sometimes wrote in a misogynistic way about her own women, right? That, you know, he's like henpecked. But really, it's that he has no backbone. That's interesting. I I read John as a flimsy, uh, ex- an exploration of the flimsy morals of the higher class, because he's well, well. It's much more in the book, but he's so obsessed with how much money everybody has, and it's not that he doesn't want to help his uh sisters it's that helping his sisters involves giving away parts of his money and he's so easily taken away from doing it because he's made to believe that he's scarce on funds right so i don't think you're wrong i think there's a lot of different ways to read it but either way jane austen is having the most fun making this man yeah he's skewering this guy simpering Mm -hmm. Ugh. yeah yeah, it, I think it's it is definitely a combination of both and I think that the movie plays more into him just being a floppy floppy weedy man who will do whatever his wife says um because I think that's more relatable for our time period than this like you know the gentry upper class whatever um but in this scene like for example Fanny's like oh yes my younger brother is going to come visit and then everyone just like looks around and then John like he, you can tell he's uncomfortable and he's like if that's okay with you like he's like right isn't that what we're supposed to do here um so that happens and then we cut to Marianne coming into a room where Eleanor is sitting wrapping gifts for the servants because she's an angel and Marianne says that Fanny wants the key to the silver cabinet so that she can count the silver and then Eleanor mentions that Margaret is missing and she hasn't been seen all morning and that she's been hiding in odd places and I this is going to come up in a little bit so maybe I'll save it for then but like Margaret as a lens for how this family is grieving is so powerful because she is like nine. I don't know. Like she's supposed to be like nine or 10, 11, 11. She, and she's just lost her father. Like, of course she's hiding and not fit for society. And then to that point, like, of course, Mrs. Dashwood is falling apart at the seams. And I think that, that this movie does a really good job, especially in the beginning of showing this. I would just add that one of the things that happens, I think at the dinner, if I'm remembering correctly, is that Fanny says, Margaret, can you give up your room? My brother's coming to visit and it has the best Mm -hmm. view. Oh, yeah. And just since we're about to meet Edward, and I think that brilliantly sets us up to love Edward from the word go and to see him as more of a Dashwood than a Ferris right from the beginning... Um, I just wanted to throw that in. Absolutely. Yeah, you're so right. I can't believe I forgot to write that down because that part was so important to me. Um, God, so that's how dare you? <laughs> um, I took like eight pages of notes. Too many. I was like, I got to pare it down. Um, anyway, yes. I Yes, 100%. So Eleanor then accuses Marianne in this conversation of not uh, having said a word to Fanny and John all week. And Marianne is like untrue I've said yes and no (laughs) which I love and then we see her come into the breakfast room and and everyone's already seated and she turns to Fanny and she says good morning Fanny and then everyone looks up like oh my god did she just talk to Fanny and Fanny's like uh uh good morning and then she says how is the silver did you find it all genuine amazing (laughs) so sassy so now here we are it is time Edward has arrived and he rides in on a horse and there's sheep around and Edward enters the room and I just I love Hugh Grant so much. I just love him. I have to point out here that we watched this movie with my boyfriend Mike and at this moment in time he just goes is that Colin Firth? Bless his heart. (laughs) Bless his freaking heart. Yes Mike takes are back. Very genuine. It's like a reflection for who we are from the outside. Oh, yeah. We're too in it. We are so in it. That is a fair conclusion that he came to, that Colin Firth and Hugh Grant are the same person. I agree, because when we hadn't yet, when I was reading Pride and Prejudice, 
I hadn't, I didn't know anything about the movies. First of all, I thought that Colin Firth and Keira Knightley starred in a movie together. And then I pictured, as I was reading, I pictured every man as Colin Firth. Yeah. And then also, as I was reading this, I pictured Colin Firth as Colonel Brandon. And also Hugh Grant and Colin Firth are the only two British actors. So like, there's, I mean, that's a, that's a joke. It's, <laughs> but to me... They are it. Except Alan Rickman, obviously. Hugh Grant famously made a joke about how he always plays the same character. In an interview, somebody, trying to think what movie it was, but in an interview, somebody asked him about his role. And he was like, well, I'm playing a a slightly sloppy love interest with a subtle sense of humor. It was a real reach for me. So, like, they're, (laughs) like, he's in on it. So he comes in and he is like, pure Hugh Hugh Grant. He's just, he's all awkward. And Fanny and Mrs. Dashwood at the same time say, do sit down, which I thought was a beautiful touch to show that like Mrs. Dashwood has, has given up this home to Fanny. And, oh, there was like a really beautiful line during the dinner scene also where John was like, oh, if that's okay with you. And Mrs. Dashwood is like, my dear John, this is your home now. And it's she's just so resigned. Oh, yeah. I love Mrs. Dashwood. They're having this conversation and Fanny is like, where's Margaret? I'm beginning to think she doesn't exist. And Mrs. Dashwood's like, forgive us. She's hiding. She's shy of strangers. And Edward says he is also shy of strangers and he doesn't have anything like their excuse, which is really... <laughs> And he does the payoff, right? He's like a, um, I have a wonderful view of the stables, you know, an error. I'm sure Fanny put me in one of the family rooms, but I quickly forgot it. I quickly fixed it. And you're just like, oh, you got the cat out of the tree. I know. He was like, I'm happily installed in the guest quarters. Oh. This is also a wonderful moment because in the book, one of the one of the only critiques I have for Jane Austen on uh, Sense and Sensibility is that she doesn't take a lot of time to show instead of tell about how Edward grows close to the the Dashwoods at the very beginning. Um, and I love that instead of just saying Edward's shy and modest, nothing like his sister Fanny, you get immediately from this scene the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. That's really well done. Brilliant. Then we have Fanny and Edward talking in the stairwell and Fanny is like bitching about how spoiled the Dashwoods are. And Edward is like, they've just lost their father. Their lives are never going to be the same. And Fanny's like, that's no excuse. And it's not, <laughs> it hundred percent is. I'll just, I'll say this now. I, I, this comes up a lot for me. This movie is very special. I think it really does focus in, like I was saying on the fact that they've just lost their father and to get real, I also lost my father during the pandemic and just me and my mom wandering around the house. I mean, because we also didn't have jobs to go to because it was the pandemic and it is the pandemic and they literally just lost him. And it's still hard for me a year and a half later. So the fact that they're immediately getting pushed out of their house, being treated like guests in their own house, they don't have anywhere to go. They're feeling so lost. I think this just does a really good job of setting it up, especially with Margaret hiding every hiding all over the place and with Marianne not really talking. I mean, I think that Kate Winslet does a really good job of this kind of stone face, like playing the piano all the time. It's just so real and they really encapsulate it really well. So this movie hit different. Yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. That's incredibly hard felt I should share it feels it just this movie made me feel seen yeah and I appreciated it for that it is it's a wonderful movie about grief it is right about multiple kinds of grief right because Marianne later is going to be grieving her father and then grieving to you know we can talk about it in a number of ways right but innocence and loss of love and right and there's like this constant state of grief of just the fact that you are a woman in the 19th century and therefore like Right. As Eleanor says so wonderfully at one point is, you know, at least you can um, you have a living. We can't even earn ours. Right. There's just like a constant state of grief over the whole book. But yes, this acute grief, I think, is really well demonstrated. Yeah. 
And I think, I mean, there are so many different kinds of grief and the fact that she's able to touch on so many of them in this book. So many kinds of grief and so many kinds of love. Yeah, I know. It's really a love story about, like, sisterhood, right? Yeah. In the broader sense and the literal sense. Sisters by the seaside. (laughs) Yeah, and it's just, I think that that's why I love it so much, is that they're like the tandem love stories of the romantic ones and the familial ones. Vanessa, you were speaking my language on this. (laughs) So speaking of sisters... They enter the library, Fanny and Edward, and immediately we see that Margaret is hiding under a table with her atlas. She's an explorer. Such a great toy. So good. And Edward walks in front of the table and pushes the atlas underneath to cover up for her because he, I mean, this is like really, they did this so that we'll fall in love with him. And it works because- yeah. I'm sold. (laughs) Yes. And Hugh Grant's great. Like, Margaret gets upset, right? Because Fanny is talking about some plans for the garden. And Margaret goes, oh! And then Hugh Grant goes, oh! And he goes, oh! What a good idea! (laughs) And all of his, like, very silly, very, like, 1940s Charlie Chaplin-esque, like, oh! Dear me! Stuff is so well done. He really... It's so good. He may only play one or two roles, but he does them very well. He does. I was, when I was not supposed to be looking up the cast and I was doing it anyway, (laughs) I did uh, (laughs) see an article that he had like, first of all, I looked him up and I just like, I only thought, like, I thought that that man was going to be 30 years old forever. So I didn't realize he's still like out there doing stuff and he is. So good for him. He is. Have you not seen Paddington 2? No, and I've heard it's his best work. <laughs> it's, he's fantastic in it. I need to. And it's an incredible film. I did have a, a, a very funny moment at work where I was explaining this article to my coworker. The article was Hugh Grant talking about how he's really trying to branch out because he only ever played the romantic love interest. He was like, I'm really trying to play like these these psychopaths and, and these like these people who are really dark. And then I turned to my coworker and I went, I mean, I haven't seen Paddington 2, but... <laughs> He does it. He does it so well. Yeah, I got to check it out. Um, when so you yeah. watch it, just make sure to increase your marmalade budget because you're going to watch it and you're going to be like, I need to eat nine jars of marmalade. So just Okay, good to know. know Should that. I see Paddington 1 first? You do not need to see Paddington 1. No, okay. believe it or not. So Hugh Grant then pops his head into the room where the Dashwood girls are essentially like looking at Zillow ads that they can't afford. Um, <laughs> Eleanor is like, no, Marianne, we only have 500 a year. And Marianne's like, what about this one? And he says he's found what they're looking for. A nice, um, what's it called when this, you're saying one thing and you mean something greater than that? Euphemism. Yes. Yes. Except it's just a great Britishism. Yes. It's like so British. I've um, so British. found what you're looking for. Hugh Grant might be the most British person alive. It's like possible. Oh, yeah. I believe I uh, found what you're looking for. <laughs> he brings Eleanor into the library and he, he, he comes in. Eleanor is like trying to get Margaret out from underneath the table. And Edward like hesitates at the door. And then he comes in and he's like, do you have an, a good atlas? Because he knows she has the atlas under there. And Eleanor is like, I believe so. And he says, oh, good. I want to check the position of the Nile. My sister told me it's in South America. And Eleanor looks at him for a minute. And then she's like, oh, I see what you're doing. She says, no, um, uh, I don't think that's right. I think it's, she says something like, I think it's in um, Great Britain. And he and he's like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And then he, he he's like, no, I think you're thinking of the Volga. And then she's like, oh, yes, the Volga. That starts in. And then he says somewhere. And then she says and ends in, uh, like, Belgium or Wimbledon. Something? Yes, Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Yes. Wimbledon. And then he says, yes, where the coffee beans come from. <laughs> and then Margaret pops out from under the table. And she's like, the Nile's in Abyssinia. I can't take this geography ignorance anymore, people. <laughs> she's just like, I can't. It's like listening to you call Hugh Grant Colin Firth. I can't take it. (laughs) That's how Mike brings us out of our our places. But I will say, um, this is also the first time I believe you see Margaret in the film. You hear Mm -hmm. her before that, but you see her face for the first time popping up there. Mm -hmm. And her luscious curls. And he introduces himself and she's like, Margaret Dashwood. And I love her. And then... 
cut to Eleanor like writing a letter or something and she looks out the window and Margaret and Edward are sword fighting together. (laughs) And this is where you're like, okay, she's watching him. She's getting all misty eyed. He turns to the window and he's like waving at her and you just melt as the viewer because if you're sword fighting with a child, then you're a good person. And then Margaret stabs him in the in the growing <laughs> for some for some comic relief. You're like, oh, oh, oh. it's perfectly done. <laughs> and she's like, oh, no, did I hurt you? And he's like, no, it's OK. And Eleanor is just like, oh, man, I'm in love with this man. It's brilliant and perfect. I mean, the, the floppy charm is all the more perfect when he's injured. Absolutely. Then we cut to Marianne playing and Edward's wandering through the halls. And when I say playing, I mean the piano. And Marianne's playing the piano forte and Edward walks up and sees Eleanor standing in the doorway. And this is really where like the grief of it all hit me because Eleanor is crying in the doorway and Edward comes up and offers her a handkerchief. And she says, this was my father's favorite and wipes her eyes on the handkerchief. And it's so beautiful and just like, ugh, you just get the vibes there entirely. The handkerchief has his initials on it. He says she can keep it. It's it's always funny to me when someone in a movie lends someone else a handkerchief and they blow it. And then like, obviously you don't want it back. But again, he wouldn't have to deal with it. He folds it and puts it in his pocket and his valet will deal with it later. True. Like, I think that is part of why, right? Yeah. It's like they just didn't have to deal with the consequences of how gross that is. Mm -hmm. That's so true. He asks her to show him the treehouse. She she says, thank you for your help with Margaret and all that. He says, oh, yes, like, we're having a great time. And she says, did she show you the treehouse? And he says, no, would would, would..." his little stutter is so cute. He's like, would you do the honor? It's very fine out. And she said she would. So they go for a walk. Oh, man, I'm shipping it. While they're walking away, Kate Winslet, as Marianne, looks up and she's honestly like very, like she looks haunted, but in like a very good way because Marianne is at this point, like, you know, feeling her feelings and she's just playing and she looks up and she's watching them and she doesn't smile, but you can see that she knows. There is a point at this part where they're walking out. So Eleanor and Edward are walking out and Mrs. Dashwood sees them and watches them walk out and smiles. And then above her, Fanny watches her watching them and is frowning. And it's so good. This was another mic take. And this should give you an inclination of what he more consumes. But he compared it to Spider-Man 3 when Tommy McGuire as Peter Parker is sitting in the front row at the theater. And in the balcony, you have James Franco playing his friend Harry. And he's just like giving him dagger eyes below because he knows he's Spider-Man. And he's mad at him. And it's like, he was like, yeah, that's this scene. It's like Fanny's James Franco and Mrs. Dashwood's Tobey Maguire. I love that. All Marvel movies are based on Jane Austen novels. I mean, oh, yeah. Yes. That feels true to me. That, that is that is a confirmed scientific fact. Yeah. I, I'm set. <laughs> I need to, before we move on to the next scene, in the, when they're walking out, this is very important. Edward says that he's going on an expedition with Margaret to China. <laughs> And that his job is going to be swabbing the floor and administering rum and sword fighting, obviously. And it is so good. And he's like, oh, I'm going under the assumption that I'm going to be treated very badly, of course. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that they've just been having these little conversations and talking about their future of piracy. Uh, So... Edward and Eleanor go on a walk and he's talking about how he, he wants to go into the church, but his mother wants him to go into the army. So he's not going into anything. And we have a little montage of them getting to know each other in different settings. So then they're on horses. And this is where we get that wonderful line where he says that he's so idle and their situations are so similar. But Eleanor says, at least you can inherit your wealth. And we can't inherit anything. His response is iconic, which is maybe Margaret's right. Our only option is piracy. Yep. (laughs) Yep. So good. And Margaret is right. That is our only option. Yeah. Be gay, do crime. Yeah. Yeah. High seas. Hijinks on the high seas. It's the only way to do it. I wonder if that's what Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters is about. But no spoilers because we will watch it or read it. Read it. Book. Book. I went to college with the guy who wrote that book. <gasps> Seriously? Ben Winters. No way. Yeah. My friend Ben wrote that book. So 
we cut to Edward reading to them at night. And this was always something I struggled with with the book. The fact that Marianne thought that Edward was bad at reading, as in like he didn't feel it enough. And what I thought was so key about this scene, so Edward's reading them from maybe the Bible, maybe poetry. I'm not sure which, but he's reading to them. And she, Marianne stops him and then does like an impassioned recitation of the passage that he was just reading and and makes him do it again. But what this does so well is Edward, after his passage, wipes away a tear. I don't know if it was like an an, like an awkward nose scratch or if he was crying but he like does the motion of wiping away a tear and it's like oh he was feeling it he's just not like Marianne he doesn't show it the same way oh my god I never noticed that I love that reading of that scene I loved it Ugh, you find that very compelling yeah it's just like he's he lo- he feels things softer you know yeah well and she's just being such a snot yeah Acting like there's one right way to read. I freaking love her and she's perfect and she's 17. But like, she's being a little shit. Oh, absolutely. And at the the way he earnestly tries to follow her instructions and does such a bad job. I know. <laughs> like that, right. Like that is the endearing thing. That is more important than reading well. Yeah. Then we cut to Marianne receiving the letter that they're invited to Barton Cottage. And this is where Mrs. Dashwood says, you know what? Let's not go yet. Let's delay because I think that Edward and Eleanor are starting something up. Hey, hey, hey. Did that happen in the book? Did they delay? Not exactly. No, they basically are at the house and Mrs. Dashwood gets upset from her conversation with Fanny, which is coming later. And then she just happens to get the letter at that point and makes the decision without consulting Eleanor. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I like this way. They did a good job. I haven't read the book in too long. Totally fair. The thing is that this movie, like, while it's very, there's a lot of differences from the book, I did not notice them in the same way that I noticed them with, like, the 2005 Pride and Prejudice or even the parts that were left out of the 1995 Pride and Prejudice. I don't know if it's because I absorbed Pride and Prejudice differently, but, like, this movie felt complete to me. It didn't feel like it was, like, lacking anything or anything was very different from the book, which is uh, very impressive. Anyways, that scene happens and she has this conversation with Marianne where Marianne is like not into the fact that Eleanor and Edward are falling for each other. And she says, love should be like Guinevere and Juliet. And her mom's like, that, they die in the end. (laughs) Yeah, I would rather my daughter not be Juliet or I sold, right? Like, no thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We cut then to Marianne entering Eleanor's room that night and Marianne is like reading poetry about love and they have a conversation where Marianne is like, how do you feel about Edward? Like, it's a pity he can't read well. Um, Eleanor's like, you just made me nervous or you just made him nervous. And Marianne is like, you know, I think he's boring, but if you tell me that he's going to be my brother... I will love him unconditionally. And Eleanor gets super uncomfortable and is like, that's that's not going to happen. I mean, we don't know. We don't know anything. And I loved this part where she asks her how she feels about him. She's like, you know, I esteem him. I like him very much. And Marianne's like, what are you talking about? Don't get out of here with esteem him and like him. And she quotes the poem she was reading. It's love of a fancy or a feeling or affairs. <laughs> but here comes one of my favorite moments when Marianne says, but I don't know how I shall live without you. Ugh. Right. And that idea that, right, like you move where the guy owns property and like the roads aren't great. And right, like these two girls have been so close forever. And so when your sister gets married, depending on the situation, like you could go years without seeing her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think this scene, just the the way that Kate Winslet and Emma Thompson act this scene, it just captures that that sisters thing. It, they're like they're really sisters. <laughs> they're sisters indeed. They're sisters. They they go between teasing and frustration and just sweetness and love uh, through like very very seamlessly talking about boys and love and you know how they see the world. Yeah, I I think it's really well done. 
Yeah. Yeah. To go from the I don't know how I'm going to live without you to Marianne's mocking. I like him. I like him. I, I think he's very charming. Like, I like him very much. <laughs> so funny but Eleanor is being so smart right like Marianne is teasing her but she's like we don't know anything about his situation right like let's not put the cart before the horse and it turns out that it turns out that Eleanor is right oh yeah Eleanor is so right Eleanor is right about everything she's always considered the wet blanket but she's always correct yeah she is she is always right but except about her own feelings yes Eleanor Dashwood, as we've said many a time on this show, is a goddamn liar when it comes to to herself. Um, she can tell herself that she is not going to be broken up over this all she wants, but she is. But in this case, she played her cards correctly because it would have been quite a disaster for her if she had allowed herself more fully to fall in love at this time. Even though she is in love at this time. I mean, she just met him, but... So, the next day, Mrs. Dashwood and Fanny are watching Edward and Eleanor walking through the park, and this foreshadowing is a bit on the nose. This is added to the script to get the audience on board. Fanny says that Edward is the kind of person on whom penniless women can easily prey. And if he entered into an engagement, he would never go back on his word. He's incapable. Their mother has made it very clear that she would disown him if he ever married someone of lesser status than him. And she's talking for context in the movie about Eleanor. But for those of us who have read the book, this is a big, big foreshadow. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it was in the book. Oh, no. No, 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 no. This is this is just Emma Thompson being like, hey, he's going to get taken advantage of by a money-grubbing lady. It's coming. Well, it's also Emma Thompson, right, showing us that Fanny, like, Fanny's not a fool, and Fanny is a meddler. Fanny is going to destroy this family's life as many times as she possibly can in order to maintain her wealth and power and stature right like she just doesn't care who she hurts Mm -mm. Uh, yes fuck fanny dashwood yo fuck fanny yeah for real so this conversation with fanny stresses out mrs dashwood and this is when she tells them that they're moving they decide to move to barton and edward is so sweet he's like to devonshire Oh, no, I don't want you to go to Devonshire. It's so sweet. He really doesn't want them to go. He's like my pirate king. I know. Who shall I obey? No. Also, I'm in love with Eleanor, but mostly my pirate king. mostly justice for Margaret. Uh, I need to note that when they ask who Sir John Middleton is, uh, (laughs) they say he's a widow, a cousin of mine. And I jumped up off the couch because they killed Lady Middleton. They just knifed her right out of the book this was a fantastic moment in the viewing party because like i said it was the three of us watching and molly pauses and she goes did they just kill lady middleton and i was like yep that's the first casualty of the book and then mike just goes hot lady middleton get fucked and then molly just goes but how 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 and then i was like molly does she really add anything to the plot and the answer is no listeners the answer is no she doesn't i'm so sorry molly i didn't know that this that she meant so much to you. It's it's okay. I will live. It's odd because I cared so much when they cut certain characters out of Pride and Prejudice. Like, I really was upset that they cut Louisa out of Pride and Prejudice 2005. But, like, in retrospect, she didn't add anything. And in retrospect, the only thing Lady Middleton added was her children. And they didn't really add much either. Mm-mm. So... You gotta strip it down. You gotta pare it down and... and I think that the people that they cut actually have feelings about the other person that they cut. um, And I don't know if we'll get to that part in today's episode, but I didn't care so much that they cut Lady Middleton. Anyway, she's dead. They invite Edward to stay with them at the cottage. Actually, Margaret says, you'll come stay with us, right? And he's like, you know, I would love to. And they say that he must come as soon as he can. He says he will. Then we cut to Eleanor saying goodbye to her horse. And it's a very sweet little (laughs) moment. She's petting the horse's nose. The horse looks a little uncomfortable. I know the horse does. The actor horse. 
but this this was in the running for one of my favorite quotes. Ooh, ooh. For... Yes, which 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 line? Oh uh, well, you know, Edward asks Eleanor, like, "Oh, is, can you not bring him with you?" And Eleanor says, "No, we can't possibly afford him." And Edward goes, "Well, maybe he can make himself useful in the kitchen." And it's just the perfect joke, right? Like it's so cute. And then he's like, "Forgive me." Like, "Oh, sorry, was that not funny?" Yeah, he right. Like he's again about grief, right? Mm-hmm. He's someone who's like willing to sit with her in the grief and be sad with her and like try to make her laugh without belittling the importance of something that could seem silly to someone on the outside which is a favorite horse yes the thing about grief especially when you're someone like Eleanor is that it's something that takes over everything and you have to like if you have to be there for everybody else because everybody else is also in grief it's really, really crucial to have the person who can be there for you. And in this time period, Edward is the person who's there for Eleanor. And now she has to say goodbye to him, too. And to the horse. Yes. More tragically, the horse. Her horse that she clearly loves. Uh, it's it's so hard. And, and this scene was really a nice addition because, Vanessa, I was not team Edward for most of the book. I understand that. Yeah, I did not become team Edward until the penultimate chapters. <laughs> Until pretty late in the game and this scene, him coming in and one, being there for her at this time and then two, trying to tell her about Lucy. I know. He really does. Frickin' Fanny, man. She runs back in and she's like, I can tell. Like, Fanny is clearly worried he's about to propose, right? Yes. And so she, like, bolts in and is like, you know, talkus interruptus. Yeah, like, you gotta go now. He's, it's on the tip of his tongue. The scene was really funny, actually, because he's trying to tell her, he's like, um, you know, I have to tell you something. And she thinks he's gonna propose too. And he's like, about my education. And she's like, oh, she's like, "Mm, your education. Yes, Mm -hmm." about your education. Oh, it's excruciating. Yes. Yes. He, he's trying to get it out. He's like, I went to school in uh, this place. Where was it? Where he went to school? Plymouth. Plymouth. And she goes, indeed. And he says, oh, do you know it? And she says, no. And he goes, ah. <laughs> so good the timing, too. He was like, ah, do you know it? No. Ah. And um, he's like about to tell her. It's on the tip of his tongue. Fanny runs in. Is like, no, 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 no. You got to go now. And then Edward has to leave. And he leaves. But this is like... He should have been like, Fanny, back off. I know. Right? Like, I love Edward and he's very charming. But, like, he needs a minute. I find him disappointing in this moment. I'll just I'll just say that. Well, Edward is a bit of a weenie. Yeah. I mean, they make him likable, but at the crux of the character, he he it's what you were saying earlier, Vanessa, is that he's a little bit weak. He doesn't stand up for himself. He is and he's not, right? He keeps his promise to Lucy. He does. Which is, like, very important. Women have less power, right? He's made a promise to her. He won't go back on it. But, yeah, this is just a moment where you really want him to turn to Fanny and say, and we know he can stand up to Fanny, right? He's like, I was put in the wrong room. They've just lost their father. Mm -hmm. And so it makes you wonder if he doesn't really want to tell Eleanor about Lucy, right? Because he. He absolutely should have turned to Fanny and been like, Fanny, I need 10 minutes. She would have backed off. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I think it's something that the book and the movie that this story is grappling with and that I, as a reader, and I think a lot of readers grapple with. We talk a lot, is is Eddie compost or garbage? Because I was very, he's garbage. But like Becca was saying, he's garbage that's good. He's trash, but he's like good trash. Like good trash. You know? Because he's... (laughs) He does everything for the right reasons, but right. he's not standing up for what he wants and he's not yeah. doing what he wants and that's not contributing much to the world. And he, in this moment, I think you're right. Maybe he doesn't want to tell El- Eleanor about Lucy, but wouldn't that have been the right thing to do? Yeah, but so he was trying to do it, right? Yeah. I just think, Anyway, it's some he I am very frustrated by his lack of just snapping at Fanny in this moment. Yes. Edward is a complicated, complicated character, and I'm sure that we'll continue to say more things about him. Um, he's compelling and much more interesting in the movie than he is in the book to me, because in the book I was just not a fan until the end, in which I was. So 
then he gets pulled away and we jump to the ladies in the carriage on their way. And Margaret says that Edward is planning to bring the Atlas to Barton for her. And Marianne says she thinks he'll do so in less than a fortnight. And then we see her look over at Eleanor, who is trying so hard not to think about any of it. And then they roll away from Norland. And then they roll away from from Norland. And that, dear listeners, I think is where we're going to call this episode. But don't worry, we are bringing Vanessa back for the next half of the first half so the next quarter of this movie (laughs) Vanessa thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me Vanessa do you have any social media or websites that you want to plug for our listeners if they want to find you elsewhere yeah I really think that the things that I work on that your listeners would like best are definitely Hot and Bothered my romance novel podcast and starting in March we're going to be talking about Pride and Prejudice but you can catch up we've talked about Twilight we've talked about Chain Air you know nothing but the classics (laughs) And um, you sh- people should go to readingandwalkingwith.com and look into our Jane Austen pilgrimage. Depending on when this comes out, there are still spots available. And there will be more Pride and Prejudice pilgrimages in our future. Amazing. All right, listeners, until next time, stay proper and swab the decks. Yes. Oh, my yes! gosh. When, he says, when he's like, what is swabbing anyway? Oh, perfection. <laughs> Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.